Who's to blame for the impasse in the GCC crisis? The Emir of Qatar says he's ready to talk, but that blockading countries have no desire to do so. So what will it take to break the deadlock? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. It's been five months since the Gulf diplomatic rift began, but Qatar's emir says it's no closer to being resolved. Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani addressed the country's advisory council on Tuesday, saying that Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Bahrain don't want to reach a solution. The so-called Arab Quartet began its land, air and sea blockade of Qatar in June, Repeated attempts at mediation by Kuwait, the US, France and others have all failed over the past five months. So, what's next? We'll get to our guests in just a moment. But first, Hashem al reports. Qatar's leader remains defiant, describing the blockade imposed as unfair and violating diplomatic norms. Sheikh Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani says Qatar is willing to start talks but national sovereignty is a red line. Qatar, as you are all aware, has been subjected to an unjust siege and unlawful measures that violate all the values and norms established not only among friendly countries, but also among enemy. By nature of the measures taken and the rhetoric and conduct adopted, it has become evident that the blockading countries are not aiming for a solution or settlement. It all started in June, when Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Bahrain and Egypt severed diplomatic ties with Qatar and imposed a land, sea and air blockade. They accused Qatar of promoting extremism, accusations dismissed by the Qatari leadership as fabricated lies. Kuwait and the US are trying to heal the diplomatic rift. But Saudi Arabia and its allies say the sanctions against Qatar will only be lifted when Qatar meets a list of 13 demands, including shutting down the Al Jazeera media network, closing a Turkish military base and downgrading ties with Iran. The five-month crisis continues, but the Emir says the blockading countries underestimate the will of the Qatari people. He referred to the series of measures to break the embargo, such as starting new shipping routes to ensure food supplies continue. Qatar and the Qataris are capable of thriving and progressing, whether the siege ends or not. We do not fear being boycotted by these countries. We are far better off. However, vigilance is needed, and they have not stopped at the blockade, but continue to interfere with our domestic affairs. The Emir made his speech at the opening session of the parliamentary advisory body called the Shura Council. For the first time, Sheikh Tamim appointed four women to the 45-member council last week. They'll help draft laws, approve the budget and monitor government performance. The Emir appoints one-third of the council, two-thirds are elected. Plans for full elections to the council have been delayed for the past nine years. Qatar's leader reiterated the Gulf crisis won't deter his country from pursuing political and economic reforms. Hashim Ahbara, Al Jazeera. Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman is largely seen as the architect of the blockade on Qatar. Two weeks ago, he downplayed the importance of the diplomatic crisis, calling it a very, very, very small issue. Qatar's Amir has highlighted the issue regularly on the international stage. He spoke at the United Nations General Assembly in September and gave an interview to the CBS show 60 Minutes last month. Here's what the Amir had to say to Charlie Rose about the blockade. We want it to end. Believe me, Charlie, we want it to end. But nothing is going to be above our dignity, our sovereignty. But we want it to end. I always say that. If they're going to walk one meter towards me, I'm willing to walk 10,000 miles towards them. All right, let's uh, introduce our panel uh, for today's discussion. With me here in Doha is uh, Majid Al Ansari, a professor of political sociology at Qatar University. From Kuwait, we're joined by Abdullah Al Sheji 
a former special advisor to the Speaker of the Kuwaiti Parliament, and from Washington, D.C., Imad Haab, who's the Director of Research and Analysis at the Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Professor Majid Al-Ansari. Um, how will the Emir's speech uh, be received, you think, both here in Qatar and abroad? Well, Adrian, I think the Emir gave a very clear and concise speech. He knew what he wanted to say, and he knew what answers need to be given to the questions of the Qatari people. I think there are a lot of questions that have been long unanswered now uh, for the Qatari people like what? during this crisis and before. Like, for example, the question about the parliament, when, when the elections are going to take place. Uh, we've heard the Emir father in 2012 saying that in 2013 the elections will take place. Of course, at that year, we know that the uh, current Emir took uh, office, and then there was a delay, there was a renewal to the Shura Council. Today, we hear very clearly the Emir answering that question and saying that uh, the reason behind this is that, is that he was not happy with the legislation and he was looking for a fair and complete legislation that would guarantee that the Shura Council would do its job uh, the best uh, way possible. And as far as the blockade is concerned, how do your fellow Qataris feel about the way that the Emir and his government are handling this crisis? Well, actually, we just uh, finished a uh, nationally presented study about the issue and we asked that question. Uh, Adrian, uh, in, uh, in the same wording, how do you think uh, the Qatari government's actions were during this uh, crisis? And we got more than 95% saying that uh, they were completely happy with uh, the government's uh, actions during this uh, crisis. So I believe that we are, uh, the, the, the people of Qatar and the government of Qatar are in one row on this. What about the people, though, in the blockading nations? How will they, do you think, uh, respond to, to the Emir's speech? Sadly, of course, the uh, media uh, in, uh, in these countries portrays everything that comes out of Qatar in a negative uh, view. We have seen this uh, during the Emir's speech uh, in the United Nations. We have seen this in his first uh, speech in July. They're always painting what comes out of Qatar as uh, being defiant against uh, a resolution to this uh, crisis. But of course, we all know that what, what the Emir said is very clear. He, we are open to dialogue, we want dialogue, and we want a resolution to this uh, crisis, but this will not be uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, with, uh, against our dignity or uh, the sovereignty of Qatar. All right, let's bring in Abdullah al Sheji then in uh, Kuwait. Um, what's happened to Kuwaiti efforts to mediate this crisis? Has, has, has any progress been made or has uh, Kuwait's uh, mediation been a complete failure? First of all, if you allow me to comment uh, quickly on the speech, the tone of the speech has been uh, both defiance and uh, confidence. Uh, uh, Qatari Amir sticking to his uh, views that have been well known since the eruption of this rift uh, almost uh, six months ago. Uh, there, there is a standstill. Unfortunately, the Kuwaiti mediation efforts still is the only hope for an exit strategy that is lacking uh, in this crisis. Uh, there, is, there doesn't seem to be any bridging uh, of the differences. Uh, the Emir of Qatar sent many uh, uh, messages in his uh, speech, uh, which uh, does not really uh, uh, shy away from uh, uh, insisting that Qatar is on the right path. Qatar is uh, very confident. Uh, Qatar has been even stronger today than it was uh, five or six months ago. And he was also very clear that uh, uh, Qatar needs uh, really to uh, to show the confidence. And I was uh, a couple of weeks ago in Doha, invited by the Brookings uh, Doha, Brookings Doha, and uh, I alluded to the to the fact that uh, the Emir spoke about uh, today that with all the, the exuberance of support and the legitimate uh, rallying behind the leadership of Qatar, I stated that maybe the time has come uh, for Qatar to go through an election for its, uh, for its uh, Shura Council. And uh, by all means now, the, the Emir would uh, to show his confidence that he's talking about uh, election finally okay. uh, right. that have been delayed for too long. Okay. But okay. let me finish with this statement, if you allow me. Uh, Kuwaiti mediation, although has not really progressed as we all would like to see it, but at least as the Amir, Kuwaiti Emir stated uh, in, the, in the White House press conference with the uh, President uh, Trump, that the Kuwaiti mediation effort uh, was stunning everybody, that has really derailed or has really put away any uh, military option uh, for this crisis. And that by itself is a, is a major achievement. 
Unfortunately, we need to work more and we have a deadline of the GCC summit that's supposed to be held next December, next month in Kuwait. But by all indications, as the Emir of Qatar stated, there, there doesn't seem to be any, any, any inching toward okay. any reconciliation or, uh, or the, the, probably the, the, the summit will be put off. All right, we'll, we'll talk a little more about, about the GCC um, uh, summit uh, that's supposed to happen, as you say, in about two weeks, uh, a little later in the program. Let's bring in Imad Hab in uh, Washington, D.C. Imad, um, okay, similar sort of question to you. What's happened to U.S. efforts to mediate this crisis? Uh, well, uh, good morning from Washington, D.C., and uh, my regards to uh, Drs. Uh, Ansari and Shaiji. Uh, what, what, what's coming from Washington is still the no policy kind of uh, uh, position. Uh, there is no Middle East policy and there is no Gulf policy. Uh, the uh, White House is uh, singing uh, to its own tune. Uh, the State Department and uh, Defense Departments are uh, committing themselves even more to the traditional uh, U.S. policy on calling for for unity in the GCC because the GCC is a very, very important pillar of American national security. So uh, while the uh, the White House is confused uh, as, as its master uh, on uh, how to really try to mediate this uh, this effort, uh, the uh, other institutions in the, uh, in the uh, country, specifically uh, state and defense, uh, are restating that uh, the United States would always be involved in Gulf affairs. Uh, as uh, as a mediator, as uh, uh, a uh, as institutions that are interested about unity of the GCC. You, you talk about the White House being uh, confused. There's a there's a great deal of speculation at the moment about Rex Tillerson's future as Secretary of State. Uh, if he moves on from the State Department, does U.S. policy over this crisis shift too? Will it begin perhaps to to reflect the president's view? more than it does at the moment. Um, I mean, it's difficult to tell what his views exactly are on the Gulf crisis. And don't forget, this all began just days after his first overseas trip as president to Saudi Arabia. The, that's, uh, that's, that's true. Anecdotal evidence tells us that uh, uh, he had something to do with the crisis, uh, uh, yet we, we really do not have any specific official information about that. Uh, but uh, going back to Tillerson's position, Tillerson, yes, Tillerson is in, uh, in the hot seat, so to speak. Uh, there are a lot of people calling for his uh, resignation or his removal. Uh, but whoever, as far as I'm concerned, whoever comes to replace him in that position, very, very pivotal position, obviously, for uh, American foreign policy, uh, it will not necessarily be uh, towing the White House line. Uh, I, uh, I don't think that the, um, uh, the main institution here is only the State Department. It's also the Defense Department. The Defense Department weighs heavily on this issue. And and uh, whether wh whoever comes into the uh, into office at uh, at State Department will always have to uh, weigh uh, to give uh, uh, the necessary weight to uh, how the Defense Department sees this, and the Defense Department does not see any. Uh, benefit for U.S. national security, at least military benefit for U.S. national, sec national security, if the United States really uh, moves away from a reconciliation role, from a role that emphasizes the unity among GCC members. Professor Al Ansari, um, you talked about the, the, the support that, uh, that, that the Qatari people are, are giving the Emir at the moment and, and the government. They're, they're completely behind uh, the government, it would, it would seem. Is that support guaranteed, regardless of how this crisis ultimately plays out. You know, here we are at, at Ampas at the moment. Who knows how long this is going to go on for, how it's going to end. Um, it's already impacted upon families right across the region, as well as uh, here in Qatar, and students uh, as well. What if the, the, the standard of living here in Qatar uh, begins to fall? Per capita, Qataris are among the richest people uh, in the world at the moment. What if, what if this crisis begins to hit people in the pocket? What happens then? Well, this is a very uh, strong hypothetical. I mean, we have seen during the past couple of months how uh, there was almost no effect economically on Qatar when it comes to the uh, blockade. We've seen uh, Qatari shipments going out, uh, gas shipments going out to uh, all various uh, locations. We've seen Qatar, Qatar Airways going as strongly as uh, usual. We've seen uh, even consumer products coming in uh, as they usually do. We haven't seen actually a real economic effect of this uh, crisis. But I do believe that the Qatari people have stuck 
uh, with their leaders who uh, thick and thin. I mean, we've seen this in many crises before. This is not the first crisis to hit Qatar, to hit the region. And therefore, I don't think that this will have an impact on how Qataris view their, uh, their leadership. And if they, were, if they were to be in effect, it would have been, you know, at the beginning of the crisis when there was a real, you know, shock. Uh, and uh, we know that the other parties here, the blockading countries, use the shock in our, uh, strategy to try and destabilize Qatar, but this didn't work. And let me uh, just very briefly comment on the Tillerson issue. I believe that I do agree with uh, our uh, colleague in, in uh, D.C. The, uh, the relationships between Qatar and the State Department, uh, the Qatari uh, State Department, uh, the Qatari Foreign Ministry and the uh, U.S. State Department are very strong throughout uh, its uh, short history the, uh, from Qatar here. We've seen a lot of st uh, st strengthening of these relationships with the diplomatic corps, with policymakers uh, in the State Department. So I don't believe that the actual, uh, that Tillerson himself is the pillar of the relationship between Qatar and the State Department. And also, Qatar has always maintained a very strong relationship with the, the institutions in Washington, whether it be the intelligence institutions, the Treasury Department, uh, the uh, Defense uh, Department, or uh, the State Department. And therefore, even we, we can see it now in, in, in Washington, that even though there's a uh, high contention in, in, in the State Department itself, but the message coming out from the State Department is very clear when it comes to the Qatari issue. Abdullah Al Sheji in, uh, in in Q8, um, you'll you'll no doubt want to comment on, on what what you've you've heard. But I want to talk about that uh, uh, you've been tweeting um, uh, since the Emir's uh, speech uh, earlier in the day on uh, on on Tuesday. Uh, you you tweeted that the blockading countries have become hostage to their own rhetoric. Um, do you think that the Emir's uh, speech? You said that this isn't going to escalate uh, uh, militarily, but it will certainly escalate the war of words, won't it? The battle being played out in the, in the region's media. Yes, unfortunately, the Emir of Qatar ha is very, wa was very provocative from the, uh, the blockading country's uh, st uh, viewpoint. He was defiant. He was very clear that they are not in the business of attacking Qatar over the terrorism because Qatar has signed up with many treaties with many countries. The latest was the Memorandum of Understanding to fight terrorism and to counter the funding of terrorism with the United States. So Qatar is not is in no position to be accused as funding or supporting uh, terrorism. This will really not will not really go down well with the with the with the quartet uh, when they hear this. They don't like probably they disliked the uh, the speech by the, the Emir of Qatar. They think that also they are uh, the, the new strategy is that uh, to be a little the, the the Gulf crisis, the GCC crisis with the, with Egypt, the Egyptian uh, foreign minister is touring uh, the Gulf. He was, was yesterday in Kuwait. Today, the the president of Turkey just met with the Emir of Kuwait, and he's uh, heading tomorrow to to Doha to meet with the uh, Qatari Emir. Uh, but uh, things really, I, I, from now on, I, there is we are at a standstill. Things are really not moving. Uh, but what we have done is that we have we thought that we have de-escalated this crisis and we have removed the military option. And there, since the, the eruption of this uh, really unfortunate crisis, that's really it's a it's in a mode of uh, no win situation and zero zero sum game. Uh, there have been a lot of uh, developments, uh, negative developments. The the, uh, the Cold War between the GCC led by Saudi Arabia in particular. And Iran is heating up again. There is the resignation of the Prime Minister of Lebanon. Yes. There is the 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 the. the if, I, if I may comment a bit on the U.S. position, that's really very, hasn't very been briefly, helping please. at all. Very briefly, please. Uh, has it been helping at all? Because it gives the false sense for both parties that United States is, is siding with them. United States has not really practiced its leadership, and United States knows that as long as al Adid uh, air base is, uh, is there and intact and it's functioning uh, very well, the Qatari liquefied natural gas is being shipped uh, all over the world. And there is no need to, for United States to practice its leadership beyond lip, uh, lip service and beyond talks. United okay. States has really now to play a major role supporting the Kuwaiti mediation effort because if the, if the GCC summit won't be held in Kuwait and in a few weeks, then I think uh, the GCC f uh, future and fate will be at stake. And this is what the Kuwaiti Emir on the 24th of October uh, warned of. If, if, if the GCC will falter, then okay. this will be the last stronghold of Arab uh, joint, uh, uh, joint effort 
to have to have some eye or some kind of right. strength for the Arab world. Abdullah, we're, we're, we're running out of time here. Uh, Imad Haab, um, will the U.S. tolerate this deepening instability in, in the region? How long are they going to put up with it uh, for, you know, if their own interests begin to be uh, affected, the price of oil, for example? And is Saudi Arabia overreaching itself, do you think, with Lebanon now effectively blockaded on uh, well, uh, two? It's, it's fighting a, a war, Saudi Arabia, on three fronts. Well, on, on the first question, uh, uh, the United States is definitely not in, not uh, uh, really happy about what's going on. It wants things to go back to uh, the status quo ante. Uh, they uh, they don't like uh, any uh, instability going on in the GCC uh, or in the region as a whole, considering that uh, uh, American foreign policy is really going after Iran uh, these days. So uh, it better uh, it is likely to stick to uh, having GCC be, be be united all the time. As for the second one, uh, unfortunately, I agree. Uh, Saudi Arabia may be over uh, overreaching here. Uh, I think uh, you know in, in Arabic there is a there is a proverb that says uh, basically uh, they're, they're running away forward. Uh, they're running away from uh, crises uh, that uh, were created. Before before into new crisis, uh, and that only complicates issues. Uh, it's time for everybody to just sit down and say, what is really our interest here? Uh, is it to uh, continue on this path of disunity and uh, uh, and attacks, or uh, is it time for us to, write, to really try to put the GCC back in order? Uh, the GCC is the premier uh, 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 economic, uh, social, uh, political, uh, and uh, partly military uh, alliance in the region, and it should remain strong uh, for everybody concerned. Majid Al Ansari, on the subject of the GCC, GCC. Kuwait very keen, of course, to, to keep the, the GCC together. They're supposed to have a, a, a meeting in, in, in two weeks' time. Um, uh, do you think that, that the GCC can survive this? Actually, I share uh, Professor Shadid's uh, concern from Kuwait. I think that if there's no summit in December, then we can effectively say that the uh, GCC is clinically dead. And it will take a lot of effort to revive it if this uh, does not happen. And it looks like the, uh, that the interest of the blockading countries now is geared towards forming a new, the quartet to be the new uh, regional uh, block, uh, block yeah. rather than the GCC. And they've actually began doing this. They have now headquarters in uh, Jeddah. They started uh, establishing media hubs around the world for the quartet. So this tells me basically that they have lost interest in the GCC. They couldn't push their agendas through the GCC. So, you know, if, uh, if you're not going to do, uh, let us play like the way we like, then we're going to invent a new game, basically. Yeah. Abdullah Al Shadi, Pro Professor, I need a very short answer. We've got less than a minute. Um, a, a, a comment, perhaps, on on the GCC, and then how you envisage this all coming to an end, this crisis ending. Will it end? Well, this crisis was not really uh, needed uh, to start with, and the managing of this crisis is really very chaotic. Uh, uh, the, the, the demands have really to be re re revisited. There has to be sitting down and talking about it seriously. Kuwait and Qatar, Qatar has been really welcoming and has been very accommodating for the Kuwaiti. And today, even the Emir of Qatar once again uh, uh, praised the, the position, the strong position of the Emir of Kuwait. The sense has really to prevail. If no, there is no sense, no logic, no rationality. What what is what is what we're witnessing here is an irrational actor model in dealing with the, with the, the most dam damaging and daunting crisis that has really uh, surfaced over the last 36 years of the GCC uh, history since its inception. The 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 the, the ball is in, is in the quartet uh, or the three other GCC countries court, and I hope that they will come to the sense that the survival of the GCC is at stake, and uh, we should all work to have the GCC back acting as the only okay. defensive mechanism and the only uh, part of the Arab world that is really functioning well and to, to, to go back to its normal okay. normalcy. All right. Th this, is, this is our, but unfortunately, it doesn't look it's going to be happening anytime soon. Gentlemen, there we must leave it. Thank you all very much indeed. Uh, Abdullah al Shaji, Imad Haab. And here in Doha, Majid Al Ansari. And thank you for watching. Don't forget, you can see the program again at any time just by going to the website at aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, join us at our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at 
AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the whole team here in Doha, thanks for watching. I'll see you again. Bye for now.